Hi, this is Ian Pettigrew, and welcome to the Kingfisher Coaching Empowering True Strength podcast, today featuring Professor Laura Sarant, OBE. Hello, Laura. Hello, hello, Ian. So it's great to be with you today, um, albeit remotely and, uh, and, and virtually, but can you just tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Right. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to join in this podcast um, and to share a bit of time with you. Um, as you said, my name's Laura Serrant, um, and I suppose it's I'm quite an eclectic person. It's probably what I would mm-hmm. say. Um, I'm a nurse. I'm an academic. Um, I'm also an experienced coach and mentor. And my specialist work is in inclusion and diversity, but particularly. Um, focusing on health equity, inspiring people to have much more self-agency, they'll have control of themselves and their lives, and to be the best persons they want to be. But uh, but doing that through helping organisations and businesses be have much more inclusive practice. Right, there's so much there I want to come back to and, and, <laughs> and talk about, and it's like, but... Ha- can you talk us through your journey, Laura? Like, how did you end up doing that? What, what's what been your, your journey to get to do what you do now? Um, my journey's been quite um, interesting, I would say. Um, it's not been a straight line. There was no grand plan. Mm. Um, I certainly didn't have a sense of, you know, one day I'm going to be a professor and then, oh, maybe I might get an OBE. That was not never, in, you know, kind of in the menu. Um, I enjoyed school. I was someone who enjoyed learning. I really, I think from about the age of four, my mother said when I was able to read. Um, so I read before I went to school, but I was, I had this constant questioning and constantly wanting information. I was always fascinated with other people and um, where people lived and other countries. And I remember looking, I think probably about the age of seven or so, looking at a map of the world. You know, we had one of those um, you know, encyclopedia sets that everybody had, you know, yeah. people of a certain age, encyclopedia <laughs> sets. And uh, I'd sit and look at the maps in there and just think, gosh, I wonder what it's like to live there. Um, and that never kind of left me really. So I was always inquisitive about other people's experiences and their lives. Um, and even now when I fly, you know, when you fly over somewhere, you see little houses and, yeah. and I think, I wonder who lives there. And I wonder <laughs> what they do. That's just my brain. So, <laughs> That was notwithstanding, one of the things that struck me when I was growing up was also how people were much more ill where I where I lived. I lived in what would be traditionally called, I suppose, now the uh, the back to back terraces. Mm. And certainly in the 1970s, in the mid 70s, it was subject to slum clearance, as it was called. Then. Yeah. But we were all the same, um, you know, very multicultural, very wide range of um, backgrounds, families. Um, but people didn't have much. Now, that's not the same as feeling poor. I never felt poor. I was never hungry. I never felt that I didn't have anything. But I think my frame of reference were people in a similar situation. Um, And it was only as I grew up and I left that, looking back now, that I realised how poor we actually probably were. But I didn't feel that at the time. And But I just felt that we needed to have the same chance as everybody else. So I was always interested in being a doctor. And the reason I wanted to be a doctor was because I thought, felt that the doctor, particularly the GP, was someone who helped people get better. And I wanted to be one of those people who helped people get better and who helped people be able to live their life, go to work and look after their families and all those sorts Mm. of things. So I was good at school. I did O-levels. I did A-levels. I applied to medical school. Um, I also went for an interview for a place in medical school and um, halfway through that day, spending time with medical students and being shown around, I suddenly thought, I don't know if I really want to do this. And the thing that put me off, to be honest, was that most of the conversation that happened that day was about working in the hospital. Now, I'd only ever thought about being a GP, you know, being in, mm. in the community with people. And it was very much the, the, the message I got was, oh, if you're really good, um, you can be a consultant and then you don't really have to work so so much. That was a message <laughs> I got. You know, you can leave it all to the medical students. And I just felt like the further on I got in the career, I would get further away from the patients. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and I'm not saying that that's the truth. That is just in my 18 year old mind. That was how it how it seemed to me. So um, I got back on the train and came back up from London. Um, and I mean, my parents left school before they were 15. Mm. So they had, you know, and they were born in um, a very small country called Dominica in the Caribbean. They left they left school early. They worked. They came to England, um, you know, shortly before I was born. Um, so they had, there was no history of anyone going to university. So I didn't have any of the experiences that many students have now, or even my children had, have been taken down for an interview, shown around open days. There was none of that. You know, my dad put me on the train in Nottingham <laughs> and I went off to that London, you know, and I went for my interview. They have no idea where I was going, how mm. I got there or anything else. And I went to the interview and I came back on my own. And I arrived back and um, told my mother that I changed my mind and I didn't want to be a doctor anymore. Which went down like a lead balloon, as you can as you can mm. imagine, because you know, for a family who was relatively poor, who worked really hard, um, I was the clever one in inverted commas. Mm. Um, it was a real boost for them that I was going to university and I was, you know, going to be a doctor and everything would be wonderful. Um, and I went back to school on Monday. And also told my Chris teacher that I no longer wanted to, to do medicine. But I did want to do something with health. And I didn't really know. I looked at all different things. We talked about dietetics. We talked about physiotherapy. We talked about a whole range of things. Uh, because I did want to go to university. Because it was something I'd always look forward to doing. Um, and then a couple of days later, she came back to me and said, do you know what? They do degrees in nursing now. Do you, you know, well, have you ever thought about that? And I was like, do they? So we looked into that. And um, in those days, you could change your mind on your, they were called UCA forms, not UCAS. You could yeah. change your mind. So you were allowed. So I basically changed my mind and put in for um, some nursing programs and got an interview and went um, to Sheffield City Polytechnic, as it was called then, um, to do one of the first degrees in nursing. Mm. Um, and, you know, in terms of doing nursing, that was that was fabulous. I enjoyed it. It was a four year degree program, um, which kind of makes me smile these days. If I if I jump forward where I still read in the papers about what we're doing with these newfangled nursing degrees and you see headlines, you know, degree nurses are too posh to wash and all this. And I'm thinking, well, I did I did my nursing degree in 1982. So I don't think they're that new. You know, they're not, it's not a late, late. Exactly. However, you know, it did take us until 2013 for nursing to become an all degree profession. So it took a long time yeah. compared to um, midwifery, physiotherapy and the other health professions. But anyway, my nursing program, I really enjoyed the academic parts. I made really good friends who I'm still friends with now. Um, but it, it was a it was a dual, a two sided experience, really. Um I did see the best and the worst of people. Hmm. Um, and I think that's one of the things about working in nursing and working at the bedside with people day in, day out. You see them at the best times and the worst times of their lives. And the, the, the professional and personal satisfaction of helping people in that situation can't, you know, I can't um, kind of say highly enough what, what it counts for. There were days of being exhausted, days of being tired, days of feeling absolute joy days of feeling helpless because you couldn't help somebody and days of feeling that one thing that you'd done had made a magnificent difference to either that person or to their family. Um, and, you know, the, the privilege of being there when people are at the best and worst times, I don't think we can un understate really mm -hmm. or overstate. Um, but as, a, as the only black student in a cohort of nurses at that time. And this was the early 1980s. Um, I also had good and bad days as well. So there were good days where I, as I say, where I helped people and I felt mm -hmm. that, yes, I was really fulfilling that, that professional uh, requirement to give of your best. And then there were other days where um, simply by looking at me, patients refused to have me care for them. So will you, will you talk more about that, Laura? Because we, we were chatting before we started recording and talking about the topic of race, you know, being topical uh, and then talking about how, well, ha hasn't it always been so? 
Um, so we're talking, you know, early 80s here, you mentioned. Can you, can you just share some of those experiences if you're happy to, to do so? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think that um, if, I, if I just make the link that for me, one of the things that recurs through, through my life and through my professional work is the idea of silence. The mm. idea that actually things happen in, in silence or in the silent spaces between what's publicized that don't always get spoken about. So I have kind of like a phrase around screaming silences. Mm. And screaming silences for me are areas of experience or activities or issues that are usually not headlined but actually are real to people because they happen every day or they happen so commonly that they become part of their history. And that I think that there is a, a need for us to hear those stories and hear those voices. And part of the podcast you're doing, they're doing similar things, to hear what is usual to people. So when we see things like we do at the moment now with COVID-19, we're seeing lots of things in the headlines around Black Lives Matters, around the LGBTQ um, issues, mm -hmm. all those things things which are absolutely should, you know, should be brought to the fore. COVID-19 and isolation hasn't created those situations. They were there all the time. They just created a silent space where we can actually hear those voices. So and that's, that's mm -hmm. kind of the background for me. Yeah. And as a nurse, as a student nurse growing up, wanting to do of your best, um, you know, I worked in um, hospitals in Sheffield during my training. And on a good day, you know, it was quite common for um, some patients or families to actually openly say to me or to the sister in charge, I don't want that black nurse. Her hands, her hands aren't clean. Or how does she know what she's doing? Um, and they would openly ask that question. Have you had training? Do you speak English? That things like that. And on a good day, on a good day, if that happened, the sister um, or the uh, charge nurse in, in charge would go with me to the patient and say, this nurse, nurse, staff nurse, Sarah, is perfectly able to look after you. Um, you know, she's, you know, there is no, there's no problem here. Or to say, you know, all our nurses deserve respect. Um, if there is a problem in something that she's doing, then obviously we can raise that. Or, and they would stay with me a little if they felt that they, I needed some moral support and I would, they would be told on no uncertain terms that actually that wasn't allowed or it wasn't going to be tolerated within, within the ward. On a bad day, um, the sister or charge nurse may just say to, say to the patient, okay, that's fine. Um, all right then. And then say to me, uh, do you want to just go and find someone else to look after? Or even worse, they would say to me, well, um, actually, why don't you just go into the sluice? The sluice could do with a bit of a tidy and have five minutes. And I don't think it was, it was, there was no malice intent, but their intention was to get me out of that situation. But and I, what I recognize is, but part of that was that they had never had that experience and many of them had never seen that experience and mm. they didn't really know how to deal with it. So some people dealt with it as they would do from almost like a, a, a kind of gut reaction of what, what they would should say, i.e., you know, um, this nurse is fine, she needs a bit of support, we're okay. And others would just step away because of, of a fear of they didn't know what to say, they didn't know how to, how to say it, and they would move me along. But then they'd be complicit in the racism, maybe well, exactly. inadvertently, but complicit. But, but exactly. There is something about, um, you know, for me, there's no shame in not knowing what to say or what to do. Mm. But there is shame in either not finding out or saying nothing. So that there, there's there's no there is not there's not the wrong thing to say all the time. I mean, people do jump on what people say, and that can be quite. But in a way, if it's a new experience for you, learning that is about the asking of questions and the discussion, not at the time when things are critical and tense, etc. But in in the quiet times, like now. And one particularly, I think the worst day I had was that I ended in, in the old Florence Nightingale wards that we had, you know, where the rows of beds are on the side, you know, not the nice little cubicles we have <laughs> now. Um, I remember once going to six beds in a row before a patient would let me help them dress in the morning. That was that was probably the worst day. And, you know, it, the, there is and I could see my fellow students who obviously were with me, they were my friends, colleagues in the same group, 
you know, they felt helpless because they were like looking at me. They were saying to me, are you okay? Are you okay? And I'd be going, yeah, I'm fine. I'll just go to the next one. I'll just go to the next one. And, um, you know, but some of the people in charge were not prepared or able or willing maybe to actually step in at some points. How, how did that feel, you know, to, to be on the receiving end of, well, it, I'm going to stick with the word racism because that, that's what it is. Um, both from patients, but also from those in positions of authority. How did that feel? I think at first, it was a bit of a shock first. Um, but I just felt like, okay, I think when the first few times I just thought, well, okay, I'll just go to somebody else. You know, that's, that was the way, that was my, that's my kind of way of dealing with it. I'll just go to somebody else. But then when it was consistent, it was like, there was almost a hesitation sometimes of like, okay, um, is it okay if I do this and some people would just go well yes love of course it is you know and and I think what made the biggest difference to me was um not only just the the people in charge who stepped in because it wasn't the same across the whole award it wasn't a case of a war a whole ward had that had that uh, situation but I did look to see who was on duty who was in charge because I knew the people who would step in and wouldn't tolerate that kind and those who would so often I would sh- I would switch shifts I would say oh I'll can I switch with you and do that shift because I wanted to work with that particular staff nurse or that particular charge nurse because I knew when they were on duty I would be I would feel safe um but the, the it was interesting because the day when I said I had the worst day was also to some extent also one of my best days because I had the six, the experience of the six people. And then I did the seventh person who, you know, just said, yeah, you know, when I got to the seventh bed, um, a, a woman in the bed, an elderly woman in the bed just said, the first thing she said to me is, oh, can you pass me some water? And as soon as she said, can you pass me some water? I knew that she wasn't going to then object to me. So I was okay. I did that. Now, the next bed along, the eighth bed in the row, there was a, an elderly man um, called Joe. And um, he was, I mean, this was the 80s. So quite a lot of the patients we had were ex-miners or ex-steel workers and had um, lung issues or you know problems from obviously the type of work that they'd done um, over the years. And this particular gentleman was, term, was terminally ill, really. And he had got, he was a really bad um lung problems because of the the dust that he'd worked in and um when I got to his bed which is almost at the end um as I went to kind of help I said um would you mind if I helped you or is there anything I can do for you and he just put his hand on my hand and his his uh, daughter was sitting by him because he wasn't very well Mm. he put his hand on my hand and he could hardly speak and I just remember him whispering um to me don't let anybody tell you you can do whatever you want to do. You're, you're a very good nurse. And he just patted my hand and that's all he said. Well, I nearly burst into tears, but it was like that. And he'd said, I've watched you. He said, I've watched you all the way down this ward. And he said, and you'll be okay. Mm-hmm. And that was all he said to me. And he, did, he wasn't someone who spoke a lot, you know, because it was mm-hmm. very difficult to speak. And I remember him saying, I've watched you all the way. And um, it was just one of those things that just struck me and thought, well, actually... For every, it's people do see and notice, and it's not always because people um, don't shout or think that they don't have empathy with you. They sometimes don't know what to do. Um, but he just it, that really struck me, and he didn't. He you know, he died a few days later, mm. um, and um, but that that stuck with me, and that was 1983 yeah. that happened. So I interrupted you on your career journey, but I, I want to stick with this. Like, so I'm interested in what you'd say now to those, you know, if you could go back in time to those early 80s and speak to those people that were in position of authority, you know, here you are, um, professor, speaker, coach. <laughs> um, if you could go back and have a quiet word in the ear um, of the people in positions of authority then, what would you say to them? I think this I think two things I would say one I would probably say to them it's okay not to know Mm. it's okay to be scared and it's okay to be afraid to get it wrong that's where I would start with it but it's not okay not to say anything Mm. it's not okay to not support that person so you've got to find a way to deal with it you know because you haven't had the experience yourself, 
doesn't mean that you can't deal with it. And I think sometimes that is, is a very difficult thing for people. If you've not had an experience yourself, then you feel, how can I, do I have a right to stand up? But in your position of authority, it's your job to protect both the workforce and the patients. Mm. If, we, if we switched it, if it, was an, if it was a nurse or a healthcare worker who was saying, I'm not going to deal with that patient, that patient is gay or black or dis- has a disability or whatever, that would not be tolerated. And I think what we have to remember is, for me, that when you're in charge of something like health or social care or in, in any position of authority, really, you have a duty of care to the workforce. It's not only a duty of care to the patient or the service user or the customer or the client. You also have a duty of care to the workforce. And I think we forget that sometimes. In some ways, um, I understand and I totally support things like patient-centered care, mm-hmm. clients always right, the customer's right first, customer first, absolutely. But that doesn't mean to the detriment of the workforce. And I think sometimes we, we, we fall into a trap of believing it's one or the other. Mm. You know, we have to move towards an equal and different kind of place of working with that. I would also say, I think um, that, as I said earlier, that I think part of the reason why people reacted the way they did was because they didn't know what to do. And sometimes there was just a fear of getting it wrong. Um, so I do look to... Um, trainers I look to educationalists I look to training and preparation for people for these roles to say you know we have to we have to prepare people to deal with those difficult conversations we have to prepare people to deal with those awkward moments we have to prepare people to deal with those it's not when you move into a management role you often are moved into a management role because you're really good at your job But in a management role, you're doing completely different things to what you would do in your job. And sometimes the management and preparation training that we have is much more about systems and processes than it is about people. And I think the preparation is, okay, how do we deal with racism? If I'm a manager, I need to be able to deal with racism in order to protect my workforce and to protect the clients and the patients and the people using the service. So that for me needs to be a fundamental part of um, training and preparation Mm. in the same way, you know, that we, you know, we, we focus on equality and diversity training and we learn about laws and statutes. Great. But we, we need to learn about how to deal with it and how to manage it, not just how to prevent it, Because when it's already there in front of you, we're we're past the prevention stage. But what do we actually do in those situations? Yeah, it's not. Yeah, a process and a form isn't going to uh, tackle it, is it? No, it isn't. And it's not going to it's not going to help you to know what to say in that situation Mm. or how to how to intervene in that situation. Uh, Um, And also how to step in even when people are unable or haven't asked for help. mm. I'm going to come back to this in a bit. I'm going to let you carry on with your journey because we're, we're currently in Sheffield City Polytechnic, aren't we? And then um, Polytechnic. the hospital um, and you're doing your nursing degree. So will you know. carry on with the journey, Laura. Um, yes. So I did the four, the four year nursing degree. Um, <clears throat> in, this is a very interesting point. All the way through my nursing training, I in. I preferred to, um, I really enjoyed the times when I nursed men mm. compared to women. <laughs> I don't know why, I just really enjoyed the, you know, it, this is probably going to sound wrong, but the men seemed a lot more grateful for the care. <laughs> it's probably <laughs> how I would have said it at the time. But anyway, the, um, yeah, so I really enjoyed it. And I thought, oh, this is what I want to do. I want to um, look after men's health. Because mm. again, one of the things that struck me was that, you know, lots of the, um, advertisements that I saw, lots of the health pro- promotion stuff I saw was focused on women. There was very little focused on men. And the men I, I, I cared for were very ill men. Do you, most of them with occupational, as I say, I was in, in a mining um, city, mining and steelworks, occupationally focused. And the men had very, uh, very little time to focus on their own health, which we know now is a, is a global phenomenon. And I'd always wanted to do men's health. So um, I did my nurse training and thought, right, that's what I'm going to do. Until my final placement, 
where I did gynecology. Hmm? That was the, I'd, I'd asked for urology, which is the male equivalent, yeah. and I couldn't go on there. So they said, you haven't done enough female care. So, because I kept opting for male um, areas. So I did gynecology and I absolutely loved it. I loved it. Um, and I um, finished working on the gynecology as a student nurse on the Friday. And the following week, I started there as a staff nurse on the same ward. And um, so I focused on gynecology. And that was 1986 when I started that. And, and very soon after I um, training, within a couple of years of me training, um, we unfortunately, um, you re- you'll remember that that's when HIV and AIDS Yes. Great. The AIDS pandemic. It wasn't even HIV. We didn't have, we hadn't mm-hmm. heard of HIV then. Yeah. It was just AIDS. And because I was working in gynecology, it was all around sexual reproductive health. Mm-hmm. And the, it really struck me then again about inequalities. That's when I would say inequalities really hit me in the face once more. And this time it wasn't so much about just looking around people where I lived and worked. It was actually about the, I suppose, the other phrase that comes into my mind is the moral backlash, the actual mm. how, how people could be treated so badly and dealt such unequal chance on the basis of characteristics or elements of the lifestyle that were, were given. Mm. And that how by being belonging to a particular group or belonging doing a particular role or having a particular sexuality or loving a particular kind of person, then almost became a crime. And that I can the 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 the, the depth of injustice I felt mm. that was was overwhelming at times. So I went from gynecology to um, there was a job advertised. Um, in in Nottingham, uh, that I was in Shefford. I'm originally from Nottingham. In Nottingham, at, they were opening up a place called the Health Shop, and the Health Shop we would we would now call a one stop shop. Very common, but way back in the late mid to late eighties, there wasn't any such thing as a one stop shop. There were, they, they, this was just not something that happened. Um, and what they wanted was someone to do a, a full time job half the week as a nurse and half the week as an outreach worker around HIV and AIDS to work with particular, particularly to work with black minority ethnic communities. Mm. Um, because what they had was nursing. There was, a, there was, some of us were nurses, um, general mental health. There was um, psychologists, etc. And there were five of us all together who started um, myself as a nurse outreach worker, particularly working with um, black minority ethnic communities. Mm -hmm. There was Ashley, um, who is now a psychologist, um, but Ashley, um, as a gay man, was working again, but he wasn't a nurse, but he was working predominantly with the gay community. Mm -hmm. There was Karen Hughes, who was manager at that time, and she came from working, she was a nurse, but she came from working in in drug dependence kind of uh, related background. So we we covered drug users. And then there was another mental health nurse, uh, Gillian, who'd worked in um, APAS, the old alcohol services, etc. So we were the, the, the practitioners. And then we had um, a feisty woman called Mayling Coleman, who um, is Australian, and actually I'm still friends with and lives in Australia now. And she was the administrator um, there. And it was a drop-in centre. It was now it's very common, but then you didn't have to give your name. You just gave a name. You got a number. You could get free condoms. I mean, this was this was revolution. You know, this yeah. was really, yeah. free condoms. You could have pregnancy tests. Um, we could do, um, we had a needle exchange. We had all the things that now people wouldn't bat an eyelid on, but it was real. I mean, people, you know, basically were up in arms that this place even existed. Um, so I went to work there and again, and that just allowed me to feel that I was actually actively helping to support people at that time. And it, it was, anybody could come in. You didn't, it wasn't particularly for people who were living with AIDS or living with HIV at that time, but it was around the safer sex message around reducing risk mm. and, and those sorts of things. And it was at the time when we still had risk groups. So that yep. was, that yeah. was <laughs> how it was focused. Um, and that gave me the opportunity to work with a whole range of people that I probably would never have, I would have never worked with um, in the hospital. And that's how I got out of the hospital um, (laughs) in working in 
in outreach work in the community. Mm. Um, and we work together with, um, as I say, the Drug Dependence Anonymous. We work together with the alcohol services. We worked with the buddying schemes that had happened. Um, at that time, pla- places like the Basement Project and London Lighthouse were only just, you know, getting mm. into the swing. So these were these were teenage pregnancy units. These were these were fabulous times in relation to that. Um, and that did allow me to go back to where I had started, which was working in the community and helping people in the community to have a better chance to to have an equal chance of health. And that was what that focus there. Um, and I stayed with sexual and reproductive health in that. Um, and I worked, worked there very happily. Half the time I ran the clinics and then the other half of the time I went out and worked in the community doing uh, training sessions, um, people with youth groups, safer sex work with Asian women, with black women, with just young people uh, working with um, a, a woman called Mo who had started up something which is, I think is almost well famous now, the prostitutes, outreach workers in mm. Nottingham and, um, you know, working with the women who were at the beat and that all that, that kind of work. And it was really, really good. I felt that we were really, really, really good. Um, apart from having to walk around with boot loads of condoms in my, in my uh, car, which my <laughs> mother could never understand. What, what are all these things? Nothing, mother, you know, just move on, nothing to see here, you know. Yeah. But apart from that, but it's work, it's work, yes. Yeah. And, and and occasionally having a, a, the, the experience of being out with my friends um, in a nightclub one night and a woman following me into the cubicle in the in the toilets and going, oh, Laura, have you got any condoms on you? I'm going, I'm out. Do you not see my outfit? You know, it's just like, this is, this is I'm not working to the fit. <laughs> but those things, you know, that's the way we go. So um, the themes, it was interesting, right at the outset, you said... Um, your sort of key themes, inclusion and diversity, um, making sure people maintain the self-agency and health equity. And, and yeah. those, everything you've said, those themes are kind of like absolutely shining, shining through. But I'm st- I still, it, as we join the dots, I still can't see how you've ended up where you are today. <laughs> right, it's okay, well then. Fascinating. This is where, this is where, and this is what I was saying to you early on about, there was no master plan, there was no, you know, <laughs> this is just, you know, an opportunity came along and I thought, oh, that looks interesting. I'm a bit of a butterfly follower, probably. Um, oh, that looks interesting. Let's go and see what's happening over there. Um, <laughs> I, I came into education completely by accident. Um, there I was working as an outreach worker, working in the health shop, and um, by this time I had, um, I think I had, I'd got one, one of my, one son. And what happened was that um, a friend of mine went to, on holiday, um, she went skiing on holiday and broke her leg skiing. <laughs> and she was in plaster. So she phoned me up and said, um, Laura, would you mind, I do an evening class um, up at the old um, Shycliffe College. Well, it was Shadow College, and she did one at Shadow College and a class at um, North East Derbyshire College, which used to be called Clown Tech. But anyway, mm. and she used to do some evening classes for ex minors, you know, with the retraining. Mm. She said, I'm doing a health and safety, health education class for these ex minors. Um, would you cover it for me? It was an evening class. I said, Yeah, okay, I'll cover it for you for six weeks while she was in plaster until she could come back to work. So I did this evening class once a week for six weeks with these burly miners um, and I enjoyed it. It was, they were good fun. Um, and after that, when she came back, they, they said to me, well, will you stay and do some more hours for us? I said, yes. So I carried on working as a nurse in the day and doing part-time teaching in college, in FE college. And then after I'd had um, my second son, um, a full-time job was advertised there and by that time I'd got my eldest starting school and I thought well actually yeah that might fit in better with the family mm. so I was teaching health education um, on the BTEC programs and city and guilds and whatever and then I used to work full-time as in education in college and then I'd do a couple of three shifts in the evening nursing so I'd, I flipped it and did my nursing mm-hmm. at short shifts and that's how I got into education and I was in education in college further education um for about four or five years in, in total at different colleges. Mm. And again, even for me then, it was about equal chance because many, most of the students I had, they were rather mature students who probably had, who were ex-miners, ex-steel workers, et cetera. So they had left school very early 
um, some of them with no qualifications, and this was their chance of getting the qualification to have a better chance. Or they, I had um, students who had been younger um, students who'd been to school and perhaps not done as well, or school didn't suit them, or they hadn't matured to that point yet, or they got pregnant when they were at school and they were now coming back. So it was all about giving them another chance, which which I loved that. Mm. Um, and I did that for, and I worked my way up there from being um, a part-time lecturer to a full-time lecturer, then to be the section leader, and then to be kind of like the head of department. Um, and I did that for, for a while. And this took me up until to 1997. And 1990s, and I was still doing part-time, doing some part-time nursing. So I've kept on my nurse qualification and work all the way through that. Um, and I'd do bank work, et cetera. Mm. Um, and then in 1997, when after I'd had my daughter, um, I was thinking, I was thinking, I really need to do something else now. I want to learn something new. Because mm. I was then um, a curriculum director, which was like a, mm. you know, the equivalent of the head of school of, of that. And I was reading something around... Um, the risk levels of um, sexually transmitted infections across different communities. Cause I'd always, I was still really interested in sexual reproductive health. That was still an area of interest for me. And I, I still looked at these, the data and thought, hang on a minute, nothing, not a lot has changed here. The people who are greatest risk are the poorest, the people who are the least kind of um, central in society, the people of minority groups, whether those racial minorities, sexual minority, economic minorities, whatever, they were the ones at the greatest risk of these things. And I started thinking, well, well, it's almost 10 years since I started work in this area. Let me see what else has been written. And what all I found was there was lots of numbers. There was lots of numbers, not much, many stories. So there were lots of numbers saying about risk risk factors, but no so what question as I as I would answer it. No mm. explanation of the context of what people did, how people managed their lives, what were the challenges they faced. And I looked and I searched and I couldn't find anything apart from statistical data. Um, and then one day I was talking to um, a friend of mine and was saying to her, well, I can't believe that they haven't written about this. And, you know, it's all right them saying about these numbers, but I know from when I work there that this is the issue and blah, blah. And she said to me, well, why aren't you writing it then? And I was like, well, because really clever people need to write those things. I'm not. And she's saying, but those people don't know what they're looking for. You know it because you've seen it and you've worked with people who've mm-hmm. experienced it. But if they've never done that, how do they know what to to count so I was like okay and then so I decided well maybe I need to um you know do some more education there I mean in between times because I do periodically get a little bored and need some mental kind of Mm -hmm. intellectual stimulation so after I'd done my degree a few years later I did a master's Mm. Um, I was still working as full-time nurse. I did a master's in women's studies because there were no such things as um, masters in nursing at that point. Um, and I focused on looking at um, sexual health of women because mm. I was around gynecology and that. So I'd done that previously. So this was pan forward like another four or five years then from there. And she said, well, why don't you do a PhD? Because that will challenge you. And I was like, what am I going to write about? And she goes, well, you've just been telling me what you need to write about. <laughs> So I, I undernawed and thought, well, I'll look into that. So I looked into that and I was living in Nottingham at the time. Mm. Um, and so I, I contacted Nottingham University and got information about doing a PhD and thought, well, I'll do this about sexual health and around the, the experience of living with, with kind of people's expectation on your health and how that impacted on your ability to self-care. So your self-agency around, around some of those risks. Um, and that was at the towards the end of, of, of 1997. And then a job was advertised. So I'd got a place to start to do my PhD. And then a job was advertised in the University of Nottingham for um, a head of adult nursing um, to work with in the university. So I applied for it and I got that job. <laughs> so that's how I ended up going to university, um, to, from the colleges to go into the university um and i worked on the nursing degree program there um and i was the head of the looked after the adult branch of nursing and i did my phd while i was while i was there um and 
during that time, I also then, because there was much more interest now into starting to reduce risk rather than just measuring risk around sexual behaviour, and particularly around HIV and AIDS. And I was invited to be on the part of the group that were putting together the first sexual health strategy for England, which was in 2001. Mm-hmm. And I was invited because of my experience of working with black and minority ethnic communities and working with marginalised groups around sexual health because they wanted to kind of look at how do we reduce risk within those particular groups. So that was the first um, national policy that I worked on. And from then I've worked on, I've been invited on various policy developments or to comment in relation to, to that. Um, so that's how I got into higher education. And then I worked at Nottingham University at that, at that time. I got my PhD. Um, and then I moved from there to um, working at the University of uh, Wolverhampton mm. um, because I wanted to do much more research as well as not just the teaching, which is what I was mainly doing teaching and doing research in my own time. And they advertised a job for a, um, a senior research fellow. Mm-hmm. Um, and I um, I applied and got that job. And again, so I focused then and started to develop my work around marginalised health with particular focus on health and sexual and reproductive health. Mm. And that's where it grew from there. Um, my, first, um, my first professorship I got, I think it was about 2007, and that was at the University of Lincoln. And again, that happened by accident, not by accident, obviously you don't get a professional by accident. <laughs> you know, but it was, again, it wasn't a planned thing. I'd been working at Wolverhampton, I'd been writing, I'd got written various papers. Um, I was involved with Evolve, you know, around mm-hmm. the importance of user and care involvement in research. And my work there was about trying to diversify the, the users and service users and public that were involved. So to get much more of a diverse voice in some of the work that was involved there. And... Um, I'd gone through universities like everywhere else have these have internal promotion. So you put yourself Mm. forward to promotion. I'd gone through the internal promotion at Wolverhampton. And at that time was told um, you're not quite ready for a promotion yet. You need to do some more bits and pieces. And I didn't agree. I felt that I was ready to go for a readership or a senior, a readership, which was the next level up. Mm. And um, so in the end, I thought to myself, right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply for a job that I'm probably not going to get just so I can get feedback because I wanted another opinion Mm. rather than my own opinion and and there. So a job was advertised for a professor of nursing um, at the University of Lincoln. And so I applied for it. I didn't tell anyone I was applying. I applied for it. I got an interview and I thought, right, when I, I won't get this job, but what I'll do is I'll get really good feedback. And then what I'll be able to do is plan what I need to do next on a broader platform. Mm. And I got the job. <laughs> and I was like completely shocked, completely shocked I got the job. And in fact, I didn't know I'd got the job for three days because I'd written down my mobile number incorrectly at the interview to say, oh, this is my number if you want to call me. And because I wasn't expecting to get it, the fact that I hadn't had a phone call, I didn't think anything of it. And so three days later, I was driving to um, the airport at East Midlands Airport, not far from where I lived, in order to pick up my um, one of my relatives from there. Um, and my mobile phone rang and I pulled off and I stopped and I'm on the on, on dual carriageway kind of lay by mm-hmm. um, and they, I get a phone call and they say, is this Laura? Yes, this is Laura. This is uh, University of Lincoln. I went, okay. And I thought, oh, here we go. You haven't got the job. It's three days later. I won't have got the job. And they said, we've been trying to ring you for three days. I went, oh, they said, you, you wrote your number down incorrectly. They said, we've managed to get it by we happen to know someone who knows someone who knows you. And then that's how they've managed to find your phone number. I went, okay. And they go, we'd like to offer you the job. And I was like, oh. And I didn't say anything. And they were going, are you still there? Yes, I'm still here. And I said, I don't really know what to say. And the woman on the other end said to me, well, Yes, thank you. I accept is usually what we expect. <laughs> and I was like, oh, yes, yeah, of course. And I remember driving to the airport, picking up my relative, coming back thinking, how have I got to be a professor? How has that happened? You know, it was just it was just one of those things. Yeah. And that was the first, um, that was on my first professorship. Yeah. And, then, and since then, I've worked at Lincoln for a few years. And then I went from Lincoln. Um, I went uh, back to Wolverhampton from there because they were looking for a um, not 
not just a professor, but they were looking for a head of the research centre mm. and to be an associate dean for research. So that that was what I did then. Um, and then from there, I was invited to be on secondment. Um, after I'd been there a few years, I was on secondment um, at NHS England. Um, because if you remember the Midstaff's inquiry and yeah. the you know the the, the, the tragedy of um, people dying, of people not speaking up, yeah. or the the lack, the unequal care that people got in that situation, and following following that, there was the um, the review and the Francis report came out from that. And one of the things that came out as a headline from that was a view about the compassion, the fact that people were not dealt with compassionately mm. and that lots of people knew what were happening, what was happening, but people didn't act. And it was a failure to act. And that was the thing that struck me when I read the Francis report, the, the phrase, a failure to act. Not a failure to know, but a failure to act. And when I read that phrase, it brought me right back to my experience as a student nurse. And even though that was 30 odd years later, more than 30 years later, what I recognized was the thing that was missing when I was a student nurse and going from bed to bed to bed to bed was a failure to act by the people in charge. It wasn't they didn't hear it. Yeah. It wasn't that they didn't know that it, it had had a negative impact on me and my other colleagues, not just me, who witnessed this. It wasn't that they themselves didn't necessarily feel it, but there was a failure to act. And so off the back of that, there was a nursing strategy launched, a national strategy called Compassion in Practice Strategy, which focused on looking at how can we make people much more compassionate in their work, not professional or expertise, but actually that to bring that more back to the fore. Mm -hmm. I don't particularly think it was ever missing. I think it was, again, as I've said, like things that are silent. They're not things that you create new. Mm -hmm. They are things that sometimes you just don't hear so much about. So I wanted to amplify that voice, that sound of compassion within care. And this, this strategy had been going on a couple of years. And then what, but what they had failed to do was actually to put in there a way of evaluating it. How do we know it's working? How do we know we're doing the right things? How do we know it's having that impact it's supposed to have? So that was where I came in. I was seconded to NHS England to be the head of um, evidence and practice, evidence and strategy to basically support, to uh, spearhead the evaluation of the compassion in practice strategy with a view to informing the next strategy so what happens next so I spent time and because I'd had um, experience of working with health policy I'd had experience by this time doing policy advice not just to UK government but also to other governments overseas with some of my international work that I'd done mm. um, and particularly how to involve and engage marginalised voices to both identify whose voices are missing and and then actually to engage their, their stories and their experience and to make sure that the strategies and the policies that we, we, we develop are inclusive. They include all of the population and don't just present one view of the world. Um, and that was brought in to do that. So that was what I did then, then towards that. And um, I then, so the, that was published after I finished and I collect, helped support the collection of information which informed the next strategy um, that, that was then launched after that, um, which was leading change, adding value. And one of the key things that came out of the evidence from the Compassion in Practice uh, evaluation was that we, again, we'd gone, we'd, we'd done what we often do is that we'd swung the, the, the pendulum too much the other way. So from going to a mid-staffs where the voices of patients, clients, families and service users were missing again and not mm. listened to, um, We'd swung now to an extent with compassion in practice, we'd address that. But in doing that, we'd also silence the voice of the workforce. So the, the impact on the workforce and the, the feeling of, of nurses and care workers of like almost being blamed or being blamed for what happened. Um, you know, is nursing really bad? You know, nurses are not compassionate, etc. When actually that was not necessarily, that wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. And so we had, we had prioritised the public, but also, but then to some extent to the detriment to the workforce. So the next strategy is very much about trying to do both those things. Mm. So focusing not just on one voice, but actually saying that in order to have excellent healthcare, we needed to give equal voice to the workforce and to the, the needs of uh, service users and families in the public. So that's where that came from. 
Um, and that was 2018 by the time I'd finished there. Um, and in 2018, I, um, 20, no, 2016, sorry. 2016, what I did was then I finished um, and I worked with, went to work, went back to work with Sheffield Hallam University um, as, again, as a professor of nursing, that was my area of work. Um, and I was fortunate in 2018 to be um, awarded an OBE mm. for my work that I'd done with nursing and health policy because I'd done work try, with, that, that had um, contributed to policy development both in the UK and overseas and particularly around nursing and healthcare. Um, so that's why, how I ended up with an OBE. Um, uh, and then you crossed the Pennines. And then I crossed the Pennines, yes. And then I crossed the Pennines. So after a couple of years at Hallam, um, more, most recently, um, December 2018, um, I um, went to work at uh, Manchester Metropolitan University um, as head of nursing. And uh, yeah, so so again, and, and that is strange because it's like um, I'd gone back to Sheffield, which is where I trained because so Sheffield Hallam University used to be Sheffield City Polytechnic. Mm. So I'd come full circle. So I was now, you know, a, a, a professor in the place where I had actually trained as a student, which was, uh, which was, which was good in a way. Um, and then now going to be head of a nursing school where actually I have the opportunity to um, guide, not just, the experience of the students, but also the staff within the department to mm. give them an equal chance of development. And for me, the, the value that we add in, in the department I'm now is that we are a very diverse department. Um, we have a diverse student base. We also have a diverse staff base, which is not always usual. Um, and I think, um, you know, at the moment, I am the only black head of a nursing department mm. in the country. Right. And I think that makes a difference as well, because it's it's not that the work is different, but I think for, for the diversity of staff and students, I think it's important for them to see um, leaders within higher education. And I continue to do my work nationally as well. Mm. I chaired the chief nursing officer strategic advisory group around black and minority ethnic issues. Um, it's really important to be seen within that role mm. to um, be driving um, healthcare, driving practice, driving inclusive practice for everybody. Um, it's not only not only on the platform of racism or ethnicity, but just mm. in in general. Um, so I do a lot of work around that. I'm also um, an ambassador for the Race Equality Charter for Higher Education, mm. and I've supported a few different higher education organisations to apply for that charter which is really again it's about the experience of students and staff rather than just one side and, I, and again I think that probably epitomizes my my work it's it's not about saying that one person's experience is, is more important than another it's about trying to build systems and um, processes that actually engage with the voices at, at both sides. That incredibly oppressive career yeah, just just <laughs> so much impact and achievement. I, I want to come to talk about you within this. Now, Norm, I'm going to talk less about strengths than I do today, but I do want to talk about your strengths, about the kind of building blocks of, of what helps you to have done all this and to keep going. And I've just been jotting things down as we talked, so I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb here. And uh, <laughs> so some of the sort of the real... Uh, your strengths and your talents that shone through to me. One was curiosity about a real, I want to know. Um, another was around empathy that, that shone through loud and clear about really that ability to imagine what it's like to be in somebody else's shoes. But then that compassion and, and that care, um, a desire to learn and have that intellectual sort of challenge came through. Um, your belief in equity and yeah. equality and that you know that really strong belief system um shone through loud and clear your your focus on telling stories and communication not just you you're very articulate but also your desire to for other people to have a voice yeah. as well and that kind of balance of a, a really interesting combination of a focus on strategy, you know, it, it's like, yep, I can get involved in these national programs and, and policy, but also a desire to do that 
based on the evidence, yeah. but a desire to see that into action as well and a real bias for action as well and, and those things just shone through for me sort of loud and clear in absolutely everything you you talked about um sorry i've done a terrible job because i was going to ask you a question and i've given <laughs> an opinion okay. of it but what what would you say your key strengths are laura i think you've summed it up well i think you've summed it really well I don't think I can over overemphasize for me the importance of speaking and the importance of having your story heard. Mm. Feeling heard is a key thing for me. When I was doing my um, PhD, I, that's when I first started reading the works of Audre Lorde. And Audre Lorde talks about the, import, the, the, the damage that silence can do, the importance of having your voice heard. And that's something that really, really struck me. Um, and I recognise that in my um, in my experiences, my experiences were real are real to me, mm. and they were commonplace to me. So almost to me, for me, it was like nothing to see here. You know, this is just life. What I've realised over the years, as I speak to more people, is not everybody has had that experience. And actually, there is a a an onus on me to tell the story. Mm. So I have the thing that I said, we, we, you know, we, all of us have a voice. We all have a voice. We all have stories to tell. And we, it's, we have to be able to tell our own stories because if we don't tell our own stories, at best other people speak for us. So at best people pretend they know what, what our stories are. And at worst, our stories are missing. We're completely silenced. Mm. And so the phrase for me that, you know, one my hashtag that I use is silence speaks. Yeah. And that's about saying, actually, in the quiet bits that you don't know, there is a story there. Mm. And if you don't, you have to create systems where people can actually get to speak. And for me, I am, I sit, you know, I've been, I've been to uh, government meetings i've be i've sat at policy i've sat at board tables i've sat in parliaments i've sat mm -hmm. in places where many of the people i work with live with work to support would never ever have sat places where my parents would never even i didn't think they even knew that those places existed possibly um but i then if i am in that place I am the only chance for those people's sto those stories to be heard. So I have a duty. I have a duty to tell the story, to make sure those voices get a seat at that table. Because if I don't mention it, I cannot rely on somebody else will mention it. Yeah. So it, it really is about being able to speak. I think my strengths lie in um, being, I think I'm a, a natural orator. Mm-hmm. I think Agreed. <laughs> I think that that is I find it very easy to absorb a lot of complex detail mm. and I can relay that in a way that people can understand. Yeah. So I think I'm a, I'm a very good translator of information. I can translate up down or sideways. <laughs> um I also think like you're saying that you're talking about um equity the two words that would, if you ask me to sum, sum myself, sum up my um, professional and my personal ethos in two words, it would be equal chance. Mm. That's, the thing. That's the thing that drives me, that yep. by my actions, my work, my compulsions, my speaking, if that gives people an equal chance, just an equal chance of being heard, or of being able to live the life that they need to live, then that's what I'm, I'm here to do. Um, and the inequity, I feel inequity and injustice in my soul. I feel it so strongly that sometimes it renders me almost speechless. Mm. I, cannot, I cannot professionally or personally actually, you know, even deal with it. It brings a visceral feeling in me. Well, can we... Can we carry on and talk about that? Because we've talked a bit about you and we've talked about strengths, but I want to talk a bit about mindset. What's it like to be Laura? What, what goes on in your head? <laughs> it is. I have no idea. No, it, it, it's, um, 
it's a roller coaster ride. I think sometimes it, it's um, I I uh, my mind sometimes I have so many things that go through at the same time. Um, I can I know that I can railroad people sometimes with my thoughts. <laughs> um, I can think and do many things at the same time. And it's taken me in, you know, in my now advanced fifties, it's taken me time to recognize that I have to slow down sometimes to let people catch up. Um, because I do, my mind does speed with things. You know, I, I am like this, this is how my mind kind of goes side to side, up and down, left and right, up, down, and someone else can throw something else in and I'll pick that up and run with it. Um, but I also know that my mind needs to, my, I can get, mentally tired in a way that I don't get physically tired. Mm. Um, I am not, I've never been a big sleeper, um, four to six hours, four minimum, six maximum, any more than that. And I feel kind of sluggish. Um, I am able to, I'm very enthusiastic. I'm definitely a glass half full person. Mm -hmm. uh, Sometimes I can be a bit too enthusiastic, (laughs) Um, but that's how my mind races and works. It needs occupation. My greatest enemy is boredom. Mm. And that's not the same as having nothing to do for me. My mind needs challenge intellectually, critically. It needs to be challenged. So I can be very busy. I can have a full diary. I can have things to do from morning till night and yet not be occupied. So that sometimes I have seen as a curse. (laughs) <laughs> because I'm, I do have had times when I've thought, why can I not just be happy doing one thing? Why can I not just do one thing? And, you know, you know, when I was younger, I'd watch people who were happy in their life, happy in their work. I mean, that, that wasn't, I wasn't happy. But when I was tired, I'd think about people who went to work, they did one job, came home, did with a family, they were happy. And I would come home and then go, yeah, I'll do that. While I'm doing that, I'll do something else. And I think, yeah. why don't I just do one thing? But that's just not me. That's yeah. just not me. <clears throat> Um, and I still have that compulsion about travel for me that, you know, I know that I will never live long enough and I will never have enough experiences to take in all the things that are possible to take in. But if there was a way for me to do everything that could possibly be done, I'd be doing it. Well, let, so let's continue this. It sounds like you work hard. Can we talk about well-being for a minute then? Yes. How do you look after your well-being? Um, when I talk about the things that I've just said, it's not all about work. It's just mm. occupational things to do challenges. Yes. So for example, um, I find ways to occupy my mind that people think of as work, but I see as well. <laughs> so, um, you know, I've always been very good at sport. I've always enjoyed activity. I've done different sports as I've, as I've gone along. Um, you know, now I have some personal training and I do um, some just road running um i've previously played volleyball i've played all sports in school so i do sports i enjoy languages so um one of the things that i didn't say was that um my family come from dominica and um the commonwealth of dominica in the west indies not the republic um so first language first natural language is french creole mm-hmm. what we spoke at home so um i was brought up being able to speak french creole as well as english um, so I find languages very easy. Sometimes I still get stuck in a Creole word in my head when I'm trying to think what's the English word even now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so I'm teaching, learning Spanish. I, I've learned how to speak Italian previously. Um, so if I travel to places, I try to learn some of the language. So that's something that I do. Um, it's more about giving my brain something else to focus on that is still challenging, but that's not my work. So now I, I speak um, and I, I can understand and speak a few different languages. Um, I will decide that, right, now I'm going to do mindset tape. So I listen to podcasts quite a bit and I will, I will do that. It's, it's almost like a, a child that I've got to keep occupied on the side. You know, give them, give them some toys to play with. You know, so I, I read. I'm an avid reader. I will read mm. constantly. Um, but the treat is not reading a book that's about work. Yeah, um, and I get that all over that. You've just described me in one way as well. So it's um, I know I, I had a really busy week last week, and then it came to the weekend, and it's like I need to switch off and relax. And I spent quite a lot of Saturday at my desk um, doing some research and 
taking part in a course on a, an area of psychology that I don't understand enough about. And yeah. for me, that that's yeah. happy as anything, you know, and it's like, but to explain to my wife, it's like, she was like, I thought you were going to rest. It was like, yeah. yeah, but learning is rest for me. It, it's yeah. recharging me. But anyway, back to you, Laura. Sorry, because this is not about me. It's all about you. <laughs> That's okay. I also love gardening. I'm a avid gardener. I'm not a fantastic gardener. I like to grow things. So mm-hmm. um, I have plants and herbs. I also grow veg, you know, so mm-hmm. I, I like the garden. I, so I do things like that as well. So it's all about, you know, walking, living here in Sheffield. We're not far from the Peak District. So mm-hmm. obviously we're not. It's not been so much peak district walking at the moment, but walking, um, you know, speaking to family and friends. Um, one of the really good things that's happened during lockdown for us is that my family are spread all over the world and we're all over the country. We're all, you know, we're, we're quite diversely spread. You know, we came from a migrant history and we're still migrants mm-hmm. in movement anyway. Um, we've started like many families have we have a, a Sunday evening family quiz and that's really good because we all get together we make a quiz up and on zoom um, so I, we have got together as a family in a way that we didn't so much when we were not in lockdown mm. um, because you know people were all away doing different things but now we have a set time and we get together and we chat and, and that's been great so family are really important to me. So visiting family, doing those kind of connection things, they are, they are, and spending time. And that's the balance for me. Yeah. Um, that is the balance for me. And the nice thing about um, doing family things is, and visiting friends is, compared to work time, is that I don't have to be in charge. You know, it's nice being a part of a pack. Yeah. Because one of the things when you, when you, um, get to certain roles and you get you know the higher up you go in your career the lonelier it is because there's less of you whereas you know you're not in part you are in the team but you're not the team in this in the same way whereas you know doing things with friends who've known you before and with families you're just one of the pack absolutely so there's a fairly comprehensive way of looking after your well-being and um, in a moment i'm going to ask you for advice so, uh, but before I do that, people want to find out more about you, Laura, and connect with you. Where, where can they find you online? Well, they can find me. I have um, a website, lauraserrant.com. Um, I also have a, um, I'm on Twitter, mm-hmm. just at Laura Serrant. I'm very easy to find, Laura Serrant. If you Google me, there's only me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't anybody else with that name. Um, and I also do my own podcast, which I'm building up. It's called Speaking for Ourselves. Um, so they can find me on LinkedIn. I'm there on Twitter. If you just put Laura Serrant in, you will find me. Um, and um, on, my podcast is on Spotify and things like that as well. And I'm just now building up because of doing much more speaking with other people like yourselves yeah. is I'm updating the, 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 my YouTube channel so that people can also access those things. Brilliant. And what we'll do, I'll include links to all of those in the show notes as well. So I want to, uh, final sort of questions to you. I, w- I want to ask you um, that big picture reflection question. What would you say to your younger self? Um, or what would future Laura say to Laura today? So that, that's the first question I'm going to ask you in a moment. And then the second one is what advice would you give to people? You know, so we've talked about racism in the early 80s, and I wish we were talking about it as a historical thing that didn't happen anymore, but sadly it, it isn't. And as well as asking you for advice, sorry, this is the world's longest question, as well as asking you for advice for your younger self, I'd like to ask you, what advice would you give to people who are being marginalised and oppressed? But also, what advice would you give to... Okay, I'm a white bloke in his 50s. You know, what what advice would you give to people like me who would regard themselves as very anti-racist and an ally, but want to be more so? So, what advice would you give to your younger self and what advice would you give to others? Okay. Well, to my younger self, um, I probably would start with the advice I was given by Joe, as I said. Mm. It's, actually, you're okay and you will be all right. And the other thing that I would say to my younger self, and I, that was, this is probably what I, what I do and I would also say to young people now, young student nurses or other people who face similar um, issues or who witness similar issues because mm. they 
you know, these experiences were, were as traumatic for my really close friends who were white English as they were for me because they felt helpless. They, they didn't know what to say or do. Okay. And I think the, the advice there is never be afraid to speak. Find somebody who will listen and speak. And I think that that applies to anyone who is marginalised for any reason, whether it's around race and ethnicity or any other characteristics or whether it's around experiences of bullying or harassment. Mm. Never be afraid to speak because there will be somebody who's willing to listen. You know, you don't have to do it all yourself. And I think yeah. that's the that's the the advice that I would give to my to myself. Mm. Um, and panning forward the advice to others, and um, particularly others like yourself, if people are true allies in any again on any sphere of helping other people or supporting other people, whether it's anti racism, anti sexism, bullying, etc. Again, never be afraid to speak. Mm. And the other thing is, is that the worst thing you can do is to say nothing. Mm. And that actually you don't have to be a member of that community or that group in order to speak against it. And you don't even have to have all the answers. The worst thing that you can do is to remain silent and fail to act. You have as much right to be offended and upset by the treatment of somebody else as the person who is being treated that way. And if it offends you, then you have a duty to speak and to act. So on those final words about speak and act, I'm going to say Professor Laura Serent, OBE, a huge <laughs> thank you for spending time with us today. Thank you so much. You're more than welcome. Take care.